Thank you for listening to We Have Ways of Making You Talk. Sign up to our Patreon to receive bonus content, live streams and our weekly newsletter with money off books and museum visits as well. Plus early access to all live show tickets. That's patreon.com slash we have ways. I'm Mo Rocca, and I'm excited to announce season four of my podcast, Mobituaries. I've got a whole new bunch of stories to share with you about the most fascinating people and things who are no longer with us. From famous figures who died on the very same day to the things I wish would die, like buffets, all that and much more. Listen to Mobituaries with Mo Rocca wherever you get your podcasts. Introducing Wondersuite from Bluehost.com. Website creation is hard. <laughs> Was hard, but not anymore, thanks to Wondersuite from Bluehost. Answer a few questions about your business and goals, and the Wondersuite tools will automatically create your website or store. From there, you can customize your design, colors, and content, and we automatically help you get found in search engines like Google and Bing. From step-by-step -step guidance to suggested plugins, Bluehost makes WordPress wonderful for everyone. Go to Bluehost.com slash Wondersuite. Hell, I can't hit the side of a barn. There's no sport in it for a guy who can shoot straight. The sport comes when somebody like me has to pull up behind him and start shooting to find out where the bullets are going. Like spraying flowers with a garden hose. <laughs> <laughs> that was Lieutenant Colonel Don Blanksley of the Fourth Fighter Group joining us on. Uh, he didn't sound anything talk. like that. What did he sound like then, Jim? Hell, I can't. Ah, uh, yeah, no, he was barn. he was much more gravelly. Okay. Growl. Hell, I can't hit the side of a barn. There's no sport in it for a guy who can shoot straight. Sport comes when somebody like me has to pull up behind him and start shooting to find out where the bullets are going, like spraying flowers or the garden hose. More like that. Yeah, 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 much better. Okay, yeah. so that was that's Lieutenant much more, Colonel. That's much more the vibe, although he's only 27 at that point. Oh, right, okay. Well, well yeah, but he's also, <laughs> he's a fighter pilot, so maybe he's... he's... Well, he's he's an absolute dude. I, I mean, he's, he's one of my great heroes from the Second World War, Don Blakesley. He, he was a no-nonsense, no-mincing about, absolute gung-ho, loved air fighting, loved flying, loved being in fighter planes, loved shooting down Germans, Huns. Um, square jawed, piercing blue eyes, unbelievably good looking. You know, when, when you imagine your kind of sort of archetypal kind of no, when Hollywood imagines its archetypal kind of American fighter pilot, Don Blake sees your man. This is a guy. He's he's just tough as boots and just completely brilliant. So welcome to We Have Ways of Making You Talk. James Holland and I will engage in homoerotic fantasies about um, <laughs> American fighter pilots for the next hour. Um, I have I have got a bit of a thing for, for these guys, I have to say. I, I, the, 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 the four fighter group has always touched me. Well, well I, don't, I didn't know what it would do for anyone. Not physically. <laughs> dropping their breakfast, <laughs> sp sputtering on their croissant right now. Um, well, uh, you um, know, it's Mustangs and Spitfires yeah, and Thunderbolts, yeah, yeah. isn't it? You know. Well, welcome That's to the really latest cool. part of our. Uh, well, we're not cantering through this. Actually, what's, what's quite good, quite good about this is we're taking our oh, we're time. We're taking over it quite leisurely, um, aren't we? We're, we're doing it in some detail, and that's good. The campaign of the mighty Eighth, the US Eighth Army Air Force, um, and their bombing campaign is what we've been talking about up till now. And we've talked about the struggle to reconcile concept with practice. Yes, and simple things like to digest the fact that the weather over Europe is not like the weather. Over the United States of America. Yes, all of that. I mean, all of that. Whose weather's normal in this situation? And the fact that the pursuit fighter will try the well. Well, I think th this comes back to the ancient adage: the enemy gets a vote. And the bomber mafia people thought that they had found a way to negate the enemy's vote. But as uh, Claire Cheno said, the bomber is going to be the first ever weapon to which the enemy doesn't try and find a response. I'm paraphrasing from the other day, and. We in the last episode we talked about how really that the time of the escort fighter was surely coming, and so here it is. Well, yes, and I think it's interesting. You know, when when we're talking about the mighty eight, people almost always think of B seventeens and B twenty fours and those bomber streams and the silvery uh, aluminum ships kind of going across the sky with with contrails behind them and all the rest of it. And you think of the bombers. It's it's really a bomber war, and and obviously Masters of the Air is focusing on on the bombers, and yet it, actually the key to the eighth 
And how they develop and grow is the pursuit plane, the fighter plane, rather than the bomber. And what the American commanders, Ira Aker and others, start to realize after Schweinfurt won, actually, is, and even before that, arguably, is that actually, no, in fact, actually before that, because you can see in the rhetoric that Aker's saying, you know, that we know that the enemy's fighter force is growing and all the rest of it. He's starting, they're already, the warning bells are going in, in the first six months of 1943. Those warning bells have, have come home to roost in a, in a horrific way in the schweinfurt regensburg raid of 17th of August 1943, and then the massed bomber um, operations of the second week of first and second week of October 1943, which culminated on the Thursday, the 14th, Black Thursday. I think it's really important when we're telling the story of 8th Air Force to, to, to really spell out why fighters are important, who they were, and what they need to do about it. Because actually fighters, the crisis, and we've called this episode three crisis, the crisis at the heart of the 8th Air Force in the autumn, the fall of 1943, is what to do about the fighter problem and unescorted bombers. And that's the nub of the matter. Because the truth is, the, the concept they thought would work doesn't, which is bombers being self-protecting and flying in protected sort of wagon trains, basically. And the idea is that they protect themselves with their arcs of fire and they, they're chucking out so much lead that it's too dangerous for a German fighter to come near them. And the problem is, is this hasn't survived contact re with reality, but they're yet to make the conceptual leap, aren't they, really, to the idea of the pursuit plane. Because the pursuit plane, I mean, it's, it's quite interesting because the, the British, British call them fighter planes which doesn't necessarily immediately make you think they're a defensive weapon. The name is a very, in, it's a very interesting distinction. The Americans call them pursuit planes. If you're pursuing someone, you're, you're chasing after them, you're, you're defending yourself, aren't you? And the conceptual leap that the Americans have to make is to turn what they regard as pursuit planes actually into attack aircraft, to make them part of the offensive. Yes, and they do. They're, they're starting to do that, and they're and they're they're calling them fighter groups and and fighter squadrons rather than pursuit squadrons. Yeah, which is it? Which is really really interesting, isn't it? Because th that it takes this long is part of this. Is actually part. I think part of the tragedy of the U.S. Eighth Air Force's campaign. The technology has always been there. It's always been available to them. They've experimented with drop tanks in the 1920s. They realise that they don't really they don't necessarily reduce the performance of an aircraft. All this sort of stuff, but they put it to one side. They they just Forget about it. Anyway, let's have a look at the fighter. Let's, let's have a look at who they are and what they've got in the beginning of October 1940, middle of October 1943. You know, who are these fighter groups? Because they're, they're less in number, they're fewer in number than the, than the bomber groups. And, and you know, I think it's, it's really important to, to, to make absolutely clear that there is nothing wrong with the quality of the air crews that are coming over from the USA at all um, for the bombers. Um, the issue is that they're being decimated by German fighter pilots who paradoxically are qualitatively far inferior to the American fighter equivalents. That is the paradox. US fighter pilots are incredibly good, as are RF fighter pilots at this time. You know, all of them are reaching, you know, there is not a single American fighter pilot who is reaching UK shores at this time without at least 350 hours in their logbooks. <laughs> so, so compare that to RAF fighter command and Luftwaffe fighter pilots in 1940, which are reaching their squadrons with about, you know, 170 hours, yeah. something like that. Although by the Battle of Britain, the Luftwaffe guys have got more time in the log books, haven't they? Because they've been doing more. Well, some of them have, yeah. yeah. But, but I'm talking about, about, you know, if you're a new guy and you're reaching the Luftwaffe in, in say, August 1940, you would have 170 hours. Obviously, if you're Adolf Galland, you've got zillions because you've, you know, been flying since you were knee high to a grasshopper and then you've been to Spain then you've been to Poland then you've been to you know done everything but but yes but if you're a new guy and that is about 150 hours plus 20 hours on type you know so Spitfire message Smith 109 whatever so 350 hours is a lot and that is a considerable number on your Mustang or you know Thunderbolt or P40 or whatever it is and the other thing about it is that the training is consistent so one of the problems for for pilots training in UK or, or in Germany, because of the weather and because of the wintry conditions that you get, you know, half the year, you know, you might have days where you can't fly. Whereas in the United States, you've got your guaranteed sun in Florida, Texas, you know, wherever it might be, all year round, which means you can, you can, there's a consistency about the training, which means every single day, you know, you're going to be flying, which means you don't forget stuff. It means you, you can sort of build much, much more quickly, but it also means that you can process more pilots much more quickly. Yeah, because yeah, you've yeah. got 
365 days of the year in which you can potentially train pilots. So all of that is a huge, huge advantage. And also there isn't the possibility that where your training might be attacked, that there might be enemy aircraft in your airspace no. from time to time. You know, I yeah, mean, the, the, exactly that. The, the simple advantages that, that the Allies in, enjoy in the fact that America is untouched and untouchable, that the American continent, because after all, the, the British run a, lot, a, a large portion of their pilot training, flight crew training in Canada, don't they? So, so you know, the, that simple advantage and the weather, like you say, means that people are up all day, every day, rather than it's still as dangerous. There are still lots and lots of accidents. And I think it's, it's, it's striking. If, is it five or 6,000? I can't remember. Um, um, Eighth Air Force personnel are killed in training accidents or killed in accidents. Although for proportionally slightly less than they are in, in say, RAF in the UK, because you haven't got sort of, you know, Snowden and mountains and moors and stuff. You know, you, 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 can, you can train where there's pretty flat land and, you know, you've got so much space in which to kind of twiddle around the sky in a way that you just, don't in the UK, which is obviously a small country, and, you, and you're competing with airspace with with operational crews and aircraft. You know, so you just don't have any of those issues. So, it, whichever way you look at it, it's just a huge, huge, huge advantage, um, and it means that by the time they get over here, they're pretty good already. And what it means is that when when a new pilot gets to England to join, let's say the four fighter group or or, or the fifty six fighter group, whatever it is. They don't. They no longer have to be thinking about how to fly. Yeah, they yeah. just have to concentrate about how to become a, a decent fighter pilot, which is not obviously the same thing. And you know, in terms of personnel, they're definitely higher up the food chain than a lot of other units. You know, the cream tend to tend to go to go, become fighters, and they also, unlike the Eighth Bomber Command, Eighth Fighter Command, the the fighter wing of the Eighth Air Force has a hard core of veterans that they can spread through their ranks because lots of them have already been flying operationally for the RAF. Yeah. And, you know, Hub Zemka, for example, is, is a, you know, I, I mean, it's, it's worth just sort of highlighting a few of these characters. So take Hub Zemka, uh, Zemka for example, Hubert Zemka. He's a sports scholar at university. He joins the United States Army Air Corps as a cadet in 1936, gains his wings, um, then went on a pursuit pilot course, sent to England in 1940 as an observer, then to the Soviet Union as a fighter pilot instructor on Lendley's P-40s, makes his way back to the US via Iran and Egypt, joins the United States Army Air Force and becomes commander of the new unit that's that's been specially formed, the 56th Fighter Group. And he spends much of his time developing new tactics for the P-47 when that's coming in, making the most of its, you know, so he's basically, he's flying and flying and flying it. Yeah. And going, okay, makes, what can this kite do? What what can't it do? What's it good at? What's it's it not good at? It's a brick shit house. So I yes. will fly it, fly it accordingly, basically. Yeah, it? but 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 he's got the experience and hours and and knowledge, intense, deep knowledge of 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 combat flying and of small aircraft, you know, single wing, single engine aircraft flying, to be able to take this plane up into the air and work out what it's what his characteristics are and how that can be best adapted to the job in hand. And and he says, a fighter pilot must possess an inner urge to do combat. The will at all times to be offensive will develop into his own tactics. And the other big mantra he has, has for, for P-47s is dive, fire, and recover. Because the P-47 can dive better than anything else. And, you know, I do think he's quite baseball, which for anyone who um, doesn't understand cricket won't know what I'm talking about. But basically, this is a play to win. The idea is to, is to take away the fear, is, yeah. is, to, is to instill confidence and to encourage people to, to, to operate at the best of their ability and aggressively. So he's, he, he's very inspirational. He's, he, he's very good at giving confidence to everybody, he listens to even the lowliest pilot who's just turned over, just arrived in, in, in the UK. And the 56 fighter group becomes known as Zemka's Wolf Pack. And in October 1943, while 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 Eighth Bomber Command are having their kind of, you know, Mumphus total misery. Yeah, I'm trying to be Latin and clever, but it doesn't work. Um, but we're having their horror month. Monatus miserabilis. Or to, to, what it would be. Yes, that's, about, that's exactly what I was after. Um, in October, <laughs> Zemka's Wolf Pack shoots down 39 enemy aircraft for the loss of one of their own. That's pretty good going, isn't it? That's pretty good going. And so there is there just isn't the same level of sort of rookiness that there is in the US Army, for example, in, in the first part of nineteen forty three. And they're not gripped by gloom, are they? 
Oh, they're not gripped by – no, they most certainly are not. These guys the, – the, the contrast is just so huge. You know, that these guys are super confident, absolutely gunning for it, know what they're about, know they've got superior aircraft, know they've got superior skills, and, you know, have the kind of swagger that, that goes with it. You know, the hardcore of 8th Fighter Command, when it is formed in the summer of 1942, you know, it's a pretty finished article already because – Running through it is this seam of extremely experienced pilots with, you know, a thousand hour plus logbooks. And a lot of this comes from the from the Eagle Squadrons, which I think is really interesting it's, it, it, as a sort of minor digression. No, well, I think we should digress on that. I think it's really important. Basically, three three squadrons, in, by the time it's done, are volunteers from the US who aren't waiting for the war to start for America and come to the UK and between... September 1940, July 41, that, that these squadrons are formed and they become, you know, they operate, all, all three are involved in the Dieppe raid, that they're, they're as much part of Fighter Command and the Rhubarbs and all the sweeps and, and all that stuff, the post-Battle of Britain stuff, really, as anybody else. And they're, they're RAF personnel, they're sort of gobbled up completely by, by the Royal Air Force, which I think is really, 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 really interesting. And, and those three squadrons become the heart of the fourth fighter group. Yeah, exactly, and it's seventy one one two one one three three. Well, let's have let's have a look at uh, one of those, you know, and that is Don Blakesley, you know, who we quoted at the top, and I was slightly going the horn for, but I mean, he's he's <laughs> so he's he's absolutely one of those guys, you know, he he's one of the volunteers who who goes to up to Canada, joins the RCAF, the Royal Canadian Air Force, flies over to gets a ship over to England, joins one three three squadron, that one of the Eagle squadrons. Motto: Let us to the battle. <laughs> Right, it says it's you know enough said. I mean, it tells you everything yeah. you need to know. And by the summer of 1942, a lot of those those one three three squadron pilots are due to be rotated back, including the CEO, who's a chap called Red McCulpin. But they then have this absolute catastrophe because on an escort mission to France, they run into an excessive headwinds on the way back, and and eleven of the twelve are lost. They just all end up in the channel, including McCulpin. So obviously, you know, you would have kind of 22, 24 pilots for 12 airborne. So there's still quite enough left. But that is half the squadron just gone in in one mission. And Blakesley is told to take over and they know they're about to be transformed into the um, into the four fighter group. But that night, he calls everyone into the bar, buys them all drinks, tells them all the drinks on him, gets them all absolutely shit faced. And then... As they're all, as he turns to leave them all that night, says, "Right, you've all got to be ready at six a.m. the following morning." And everyone kind of sort of slightly gulps. And the next morning, he tells them all to take off together. Now, you know, on a grass effort, what you would normally do is sort of fly off in a vic of three or possibly four racing cross, but you don't have kind of sixteen of them, kind of taking off. But he's absolutely non-negotiable on this, and he goes, you know, yelling at them to tighten up and show the bastards. And what he means is. The other Eagle Squadron, the other two Eagle Squadrons who are based at Debden, because 133 Squadron is at Great Samford, which is a satellite of Debden. And everyone's so kind of, you know, the other pilots are so shocked by this that they all absolutely kind of sober up immediately, wake up and absolutely do exactly what he says. And they fly in perfect formation at 500 feet over, over Debden. And as Jim Goodson, who was one of those pilots in 133 Squadron, who had been at the bar the night before, says, that evening, Blakesley wasn't the only 133 pilot with belligerent swagger. So it kind of, it's, a, it's certainly an unorthodox way of about going about things, but it absolutely does the trick. That's proper leading from the front. You know, we're all in this together. Leadership, exactly. isn't it? You know, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's setting out his stall. It's setting. It's saying, "I'm going to do things like this." You know, it's- they're escorting um, American uh, fortresses on that the raid where they come back and lose tw- twelve people in the headwind, aren't they? So, yeah. is, or eleven, eleven out of the twelve. It was really interesting, that isn't it? So they are already involved in, in escorting American bombers. So then they get turned into three, three, six. Again, I just love the Americans. The numbers are all bigger. Just, just from the off, but you know, <laughs> one, three, three. Let's add a couple of hundred. Yeah, one three three. No, you're three three six now. So they so quickly they get they they get turned around. And I think I think it's really I think it's it, obviously the the RAF probably have no probably have no option but to surrender this this squadron of pilots today. Yes, and they 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 paint off the ra- the rondels and put in the kind of American star on their Spitfires. Uh, and Blakesley's really happy about this. He loves Spitfires. You know, this is what he you know he likes a sort of thoroughbred. So he gets very pissed off when when they transfer to P forty sevens instead. A three three six still exist. 
the Rocketeers. So they traded. They've they've traded in um, Letters to the Battle, which is a bit more sort of RAF and Demure for Rocketeers. So there's, <laughs> you could argue that there's your cultural difference straight there. <laughs> but he loves fighting. We love fighting. Fighting is a grand sport, and he leads from the front. You know that's the point. You know he he's only interested in people who want to take action. To, you know take the fight to the enemy. You know he's a, he's aggressive, confident, instills confidence in everyone else. Everyone wants to kind of follow him. He's just a he's just a natural leader of men and the amazing thing is you know he's been glib about the barn door thing i mean he's a much better shot than he's giving giving himself credit for he he can't do deflection shooting but that's okay he just goes up the leadership is the point and although he's the xo he carries on flying combat which shows he's he's doing that thing of you know i'm not going to ask anything you to do anything that i'm not prepared to do myself yeah but he also he absolutely loves it he's an adrenaline junkie you know he's the kind of sort of guy that's going to parachute off everest i mean you know he he just he he can't he can't get enough of it. He just he just loves flying and he loves shooting down Huns. I mean that. And that... if you're a if you're an Eagle Squadron qualified pilot and you go to the US Air Force, you you Army Air Force, you retain your wings, but you're not allowed. You're you're allowed to wear smaller wings, and that counts as an American. The Army Air Force go all right. Okay, you are a pilot. It's fine. You're qualified. You don't need to. You don't need to qualify. But they all wear the Eagle Squadron guys all wear small RAF wings on their uniforms as a sort of. Um, That's right. As That's a, right. As a calling card, basically. It's worth mentioning another a, a couple of others, I think, because I think that you know these are just they're, they're different, but they're interesting characters. So, so another another one is 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 Captain Dwayne B. Beeson, who's twenty two in nineteen forty three. He's from Boys Boys Boise, Idaho. Oh, Boise, Idaho. And he was going to become a lawyer, but decides he wants to become a pilot instead. So he goes to Canada, joins the RCAF, ends up in the Eagle Squadrons. He's quite the opposite of of Blakesley. You know, he's he's fastidious. Um, sees flying as a science. He says in the RAF, he was always spoiling to go out and kill Germans, having picked up an unaccountable Hun phobia somewhere along the line. You know, that's the sort of line that's written by the PR, the, the four fighter group PR officer. And of course, it says much about the four fighter group and the way that these these boys are, these units are set up, that they do have their own PR officers. And, you know, he just wants to get better and better. There's no complacency about Beeson whatsoever. You know, he, he practices deflection shooting all the time using a homemade gunnery gadget. Uh, and he's a great student of warfare. You know, he reads a lot about the earlier races. You know, he really analyzes it. And he becomes the four fighter groups first ace on the 8th of October, 1943. Another of the characters is John Gentile, who's, um, he writes, you know, I can't remember the time when airplanes were not part of my life and can't remember ever wanting anything so much as to fly one. So he, he, as a boy, as a teenager, he stays up with a friend and, and buys an absolute wreck. Uh, unfortunately, his father comes to his rescue and, and, and gets it checked out and they realise that it's an absolute death trap and this guy, both he and his friend, have been completely ripped off. His father stops him flying but then eventually helps him get get an aircraft later on when he's a little bit older and wiser. And, you know, he's very dashing he's very good looking he's he's from um, italian stock and known as gentle and he's just a superb pilot again like blakesley he's he's an adrenaline junkie he just loves it he can't get enough of it he just wants to go faster and faster and faster but he is a superb pilot but they've had he's had the opportunity to discover that because the training's proper and in depth and all that so i mean that's what one of the things i think is really striking about this is I, I imagine there were plenty of superb pilots who went into the German training scheme, but they just never got the opportunity to to become them. Well, also there's not a culture of nurturing in the in the Luftwaffe in the way that there is in the in the United States Army Air Force and and in a fighter command where it is absolutely drummed into all of them that when new guys come, it is your job to kind of make them really good too. You know, we're all in it together, and everyone wants to become an ace. Whereas in Luftwaffe's um, fighter groups, it's all about the expert and it's all about the, the experts, the, the guys of the Knights Cross who've got 25 victories. And the, the job of the rest of the fighter pilots is to further their score and, and further enhance them as a kind of sort of unique standout individual. That, that's not not how it is. And to kind of, to rather kind of ram home that point, um, one of the flight commanders, Captain Spike Miley, is rotated back home in, uh, in October 1943 and, and Gentile takes over from him. And a mighty takes him to one side before he before he ships out and says, "All right, you know you're red hot and it's natural you should want to be a firecracker, but you've got boys following you now who have things to learn before they get red hot. They're going to follow you wherever you take them. Remember that whenever you take them anywhere, remember that whenever you take them anywhere, it's not only your brains that are going to get knocked out, but the brains of the kids who are depending on you." And Gentile takes this advice to heart. 
and it's very much part of the of the eight fighter command ethos that young pilots arriving with plenty of flying skill need to be brought up to pace as fighter pilots and they're they're nurtured and that that is that is so different from the Luftwaffe way of doing things. Yeah, 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 but I mean this is this is what's interesting is isn't it is that there is a system in place to nurture people and encourage them. Who knows if they ever would have been brilliant pilots, but the systems the systems able to find them able to give and give them time. I mean, I think the fact that someone has hundreds of hours in their logbook, it's critically important as a difference. It so is. And flying a fighter plane, and obviously flying in a bomber is incredibly physically rigorous because it's really, really, really cold. You need your oxygen, you need proper air. So, you you know, if you if you fly to Ray Schweinfurt and back and you survive, you've been on oxygen basically for... Um, you know, nine tenths of that flight, haven't you? The, the minute they're at altitude, on it goes. If they've got themselves one of those suits that warms warms them up, then then lucky them. It may break down. You need to go to the toilet. If you go in the, if you end up going to the toilet in your uniform, it'll freeze. It might, you know, if you take your gloves off and touch the metal, it'll take the skin off your hands. And on and on and on. Before oh, this is, no, and this no, is before no. anyone comes comes at shooting at you. If you're a fighter pilot, you're much more. You're putting your body through far more in terms of G in terms of, you know, the cold and the stress and all that of flying the aircraft and the altitude you're flying at and the speeds you're flying at are all incredibly physically demanding in a different way to being a tail gunner who's sort of sat there an awful long time trying to concentrate peering out the window, basically. Yeah. Stay warm, keep his mind together and all that. And you're being decisive and you need to be physically capable of being decisive. So, I mean, you know, if you meet modern fighter pilots, Unfortunately, this is sort of Top Gun, isn't it? I mean, it is called square jawed, square jawed guys who play who play beach volleyball, <laughs> volleyball and look, look ripped. Yeah, no, it is a bit like that. I mean, but but it is it is noticeable that these guys are. It is a small thing, but but they are they are incredibly healthy because flying a fighter plane is it's different from flying a flying a B seventeen, but it's but but it is still mentally and physically incredibly demanding. So you need to be fit. You need to be well fed. You need to be physically strong. And these guys all are. Again, that's just a that's a little five percent thing. But but five you know percentages are are absolutely vital. I think the key thing here is is that you know you've got your three hundred and fifty hours in your log, but you're arriving over in England. No one is expecting you to fly to, you know to Bremen the next day. So what happens is you, you know because there's forty five pilots in a, in a in a squadron to have sixteen airborne at any one moment. There you know by this stage there's, there's no longer twelves. It's it's sixteen four flights of you know fours. And four flights of four, you know, in, in the in the old finger four formation that the Germans use, and uh, which is much more useful when you're attacking. By the way, you know, a Vic is much better for a defensive formation, but but the the swarm, the finger four, is much better for. Uh, and it's called a finger four because if you hold out your hand, you've got two fingers which are slightly ahead of the other two, um, and it's and it's done in that that kind of that one pattern. off on the corner. Right, right, exactly. And that new guy will be taken up into the air for practice training flights first. You know, no one's just going to send him over the channel before he's he's ready. And, you know, Don Gentile might take him up and show him a few tricks and, and you know, see if he can get on my tail, son, and all that kind of stuff and, and learn some ropes. And, and he'll have a week or so of doing that. Then the first operational mission he does will be a milk run. You know, it'll be a kind of just a channel hop or something. And so you're easing these guys into it. You know, the contrast of the Luftwaffe by October 1943 could not be more stark because because you're in, you're flying, the next day you're kind of attacking, you know, flying fortresses, um, you know, over Hamlin um, or, or Munster or whatever. And you're and attacking them head on. And you're attacking them head on. You've got no experience. And, and you know, in your logbooks, you, you, you're lucky if you've got three figures, um, you know, if you've got 100 hours. So it's just, it's so different. So there is this huge qualitative gulf between what eight fighter command can bring to the party and what the Luftwaffe can bring to the party. The problem is they can't get in amongst them very well. And so this is the big problem in October 1943, that you've got really superior fighter pilots in, in the mighty Ave who can't do what they need to do. Yeah, they can't get And there. you've got bombers which need to destroy the Luftwaffe and need to destroy the, the German aircraft industry, but can't effectively reach those targets because whenever they do, they get decimated. So clearly the answer is to bring those fighter pilots into the battle all the way to Regensburg, all the way to Wiener Neustadt, all the way to Munster and Halberstadt and Bremen and all the rest of it. But how do you do that? That is the problem. That is the crisis. And that is that is the dilemma that's facing. And because of Overlord, what you're effect- so what you're doing, because of Overlord, because you need the skies clear, 
you're escorting is a defensive posture. You're changing escort from a defensive to an offensive posture. You've got the pilots to do it. You've got the aircraft to do it. You can't get the aircraft there because you need to, you need to invent something that will possibly, what could it be? Um, we will, oh. um, well, we'll be back after the break to explain how MDF saved the world. We'll see you in a tick. If you're looking for plump lips at last, you need to know about Juvederm Lip Fillers. With Juvederm Volbella XE and Juvederm Ultra XE, your lip look, whether it's subtle or bold, can last up to one full year with optimal treatment and no additional maintenance. Find a licensed specialist and see if it's right for you at Juvederm.com today. That's J-U-V-E-D-E-R-M.com. Add fullness to lips in adults over 21 with Juvederm Volbella XE or Juvederm Ultra XE. Do not use if you have severe allergies or a history of severe allergic reactions, or if you are allergic to lidocaine or the proteins used in Juvederm. Tell your doctor if you have a history of scarring or taking medicines that decrease the body's immune response or that can prolong bleeding. Common side effects include injection site redness, swelling, pain, tenderness, firmness, lumps, bumps, bruising, discoloration, or itching. As with all gel fillers, there's a rare risk of unintentional injection into a blood vessel, which can cause vision abnormalities, blindness, stroke, temporary scabs, or scarring. For full important safety information, visit www.juvederm.com. Why does this room look amazing? What'd you change? I just got these custom shades from blinds.com. It's all online, so it's really easy. I remember shopping for blinds. I waited around all day just to get a quote. It took forever. And the worst part, hidden fees. How about you? I chatted with my blinds.com design consultant on my time. Plus, they make it easy to DIY or add installation like I did. Blinds.com sounds way better. Way better. Shop blinds.com for up to 45% off. Rules and restrictions may apply. Welcome back to We Have Ways of Making You Talk. Just wanted to give you a moment there without any dodgy American accents. So... Um, <laughs> I think you should bring them back immediately. So, well, so we are in part so, two. <laughs> um, Adolf the campaign Hitler. continues. I mean, Adolf Hitler implies the existence of a B. Dolph Hitler and then a C. Dolph Hitler. <laughs> in a time of war. So, what we've done there is we've sort of analyzed the essentially the weapon that is available to the US Eighth Army Air Force. But can't be brought to bear. That's the point. That's the frustration. They're still going out. The daylight bombing. I mean, it's really interesting, isn't it? Because the, because they do try some. There's a point at which the Eighth do try some night bombing, isn't there? They have a go. A little bit. A little bit. A, a little bit. And they don't lose lots of crews and everything, but they still aren't <laughs> convinced. I, I have to say. I mean, this is a story about how powerful ideology can be. That's a really good point. Yeah. Uh, what, what a grit. I'm not people's... going to be deterred off this path. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep yeah, going. Exactly. Don't dissuade me. Don't dissuade me. And this this sort of thing that it just, it's not that the idea is wrong. We just haven't applied it right yet, which I think is, which is such an interesting mindset. And well, and they're not entirely wrong either. Yeah, but they're not, but they're not entirely right. And, and they're chewing through crews. Oh, yes. They? Yeah, and this anyway. But but it also underlines, doesn't it, how new it is, how new this technology is, how new this type of warfare is, how new the United States are to kind of being a global military power. I mean, that's that's the other point to consider. I mean, here we are in October 1943, and you know the first bomber mission by by the Mighty Eighth is only the previous August. Yeah, and yeah, in yeah. the middle of that is the hiatus of diverting lots of their troop that a lot of their um crews and, and aircraft to north africa so and the war in northwest europe has what only 18 months left to run i mean they don't obviously that's the bit they don't know that's the bit they don't know but but it's, it's worth isn't it mentioning that you, you know despite the catastrophe of october you know they're, 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 they're still going out every night but but not really deep into the reich anymore and that's that's the problem because it is going into the reich which is where the point blank targets are and for those who who, who haven't listened to the earlier one Point blank is the directive given. It's the main mission of the Mighty Eighth at this time, which is to destroy the German aircraft industry. That's their priority target. They're just not able to do it. So 11th of November, 347 bombers attack Munster. Has to be abandoned because of bad weather. Only 59 make it. 13th of November, 272 planes scheduled to hit Bremen, but only 143 reach target. Again, bad weather is 
put, puts, you know, is, is the problem. The weather in November is consistently awful. 16th of November, 189 dispatched, but only 130 fly to Narbonne. 18th of November, 102 dispatched, you know, not big numbers, are they? Um, to Oslo this time, but only 82 actually get there. 19th of November, 167 scheduled, 130 only fly to the German Dutch border. So, you know, and so on and so on. Are they using H2X by this point? Because, um, yes, they are. Uh, yeah. yeah. One of the things I think is really interesting about the, the obviously, so H2X, um, for those who don't know, is the American version of H2S, which is the downward looking radar that the RAF Bomber Command of, of Perfected. If you look at a Lancaster, there's a sort of yep. half an egg on its underside shape. That's right. Yes. And it's as simple as a radar that points downwards and gives you a rough map on a cathode ray tube of the yes. ground below because the water is flat and so reflects the signal straight back at you and the earth is all disrupted ground you know landscape is disrupted so you get, that's how it creates a picture it's effectively ground mapping radar and ground a, mapping uh, radar but but the you know very first kind and um, what it's really really good for is finding somewhere like hamburg because it's on the coast and you get a very very you get a very very clear image if there's water so you can fly you know you can find the rhine you can find the ruhr you can use it to use it to map read and at this point um Acre has, uh, it's very, very interesting because because Harris resists the Pathfinder thing in, in Bomber Command tooth and nail and then gives into it and then it becomes an, a really effective way of delivering um, the bomber stream to its target. With, you know, planes going in first, they find the target, they go in first, they mark it with what they call Christmas tree lights, Germans call Christmas tree lights, and drop incendiaries, mark coloured incendiaries on the target or as close as they can and then everyone bombs to that. And because the Americans have switched to this idea that the lead bombardier flies the aircraft with the autopilot, they're experimenting with Pathfinders and H2X. So because the truth is you are bombing through cloud all the time over Northwest Europe. And the Americans have to reconcile themselves to the fact they can't do precision bombing. So Acre's given in and he has Pathfinders, he has H2X. However, I mean, I think one of the really interesting things about this is that people send their not their best crews from their squadrons to to train on the H two X because they don't rate it, so they don't send their best people. They don't trust it, and they also don't like the fact the American crews don't like the fact that it's essentially an admission that you're bombing through cloud and that you're blind bombing, that you're area bombing like like the British. And so yes, they've got H two X. Yes, they have a way of finding their way to the target. But no, they're not necessarily using it to their best advantage. And I think that's because because we were talking about ideology before the break. The bomb, the pilots believe in this ideology that they're that they're bombing precision. They're not killing civilians. That they're not doing what the British are doing, which is the British going well. You know, that actually, and this is born of the technology not being there yet. So there's this interesting contrast where the technology is improving to the point where the British don't need to area bomb anymore. Not strictly speaking. And the, the Americans are faced with the circumstances where they have to area bomb because the technology isn't up to bombing them, getting them through bad weather and delivering them on target. Yes, it's, 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 it's these two opposite views and they're sort of meeting in the middle. They're sort of meeting they? in the middle. And it, that is a really interesting. I think it's really They're using the same aids because the Americans are using oboe as well, aren't they? So, so they're, yeah, they they, are, yeah. they're using the same aids that Bomber Command. So, so I think what's really interesting, again, there, there's an awful lot of allied cooperation. They've got the access to the same resources. You know, it's really interesting in Don Miller, in Don Miller's book, The Mighty Eighth, um, that H2X is in it, but it's really mentioned in passing. And yet, if you read a bomber command history, H2X is absolutely central to the story. Well, it's all about this. About it's all about the striving to improve the navigational aids. I mean, that's one of the reasons why why Harris doesn't launch his all-out offensive till sixth of March, nineteen forty-three, having taken over in February, nineteen forty-two. So fourteen months earlier, thirteen months earlier, because he doesn't think stuff's ready, and he knows this stuff is coming online, but it's just not there yet. And he doesn't want to do it until he can be more effective. You know, when he's got more bombers, more um, better means of of targeting the the targets that he's going for. But you have this feeling amongst the American bomber crews. It's really, really interesting that they're they're going. We don't. We're not. We don't kill civilians. We, this isn't what we do. So these raids, these raids where they they can't get to you know they can't get to Munster, where they're bombing blind, where the weather's bad, are also bad for morale. When morale is already bad. When morale's already bad, because it's, they seem to be running running fundamentally counter for the war they think they've come to Britain to fight. 
And that's a devastating moment, isn't it? That realisation is, is, is devastating. Yeah, yeah. It's really, 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 really devastating moment for them. And they're going into the winter, bombing blind. And, and the truth is, you know, I, I, you know, it's something like there's two clear days weather in the whole of the winter of 1950. They've got to do this or they, or they sit on their hands and don't go. Well, they've got to do it because the clock is ticking and they need to clear the airspace before before the cross channel invasion. And and everyone is getting, you know, the, the tension is ratcheting up. I mean, obviously, the senior commanders are hiding this particular aspect from the air crews, but even so, it is that pressure is filtering down the pressure to do things. And and I think the scale of the slaughter has shocked everybody. And of course, it's really, really tough on the crews because you come back from a mission suddenly, you know, they're in your Quonset hut where you had kind of, you know, maybe, you know, four crews in one Quonset hut. You know, half the beds are empty suddenly. Where this mo- that morning they were full, and that that that's really difficult. And there's a very good diary that's kept by um, Major James Good Brown, who is the chaplain of the 381st Bomb Group, which is at Ridgewell in Essex. And and there's still lots of it still left. Actually, it's a great it's a great airfield to visit. But by the beginning of December, he notes what a, a massive change has come over the men of the group, and he says. The replacements come into the group as strangers, and they feel distant. No matter what one does, they feel somewhat lost. There's no way of getting around this difficulty because we're not members of the. They were not members of the 381st during the long months of training back in the states when you know obviously the bomb group is formed. So they don't have that bond. The new crews know too that they are not part of the original group. They know also that they may go down in combat. This was not true of the original group. Not a single man expected to be shot down. We were innocent. We did not know war. That is why we hung together like a bunch of dead-end kids. We hung together in desperation. As each man went down, we clung tighter. We could not believe what was happening. Each loss came to us as a shock. When we had the bottom shot out of us this past summer, it was a deadening blow. Only those here at the time can fully experience what happened on this base. Then, when one day this fall, the same thing happened, taking away the last half, i.e. This, this is the October bit, the half that was on its way completing 25 missions, it nearly killed us. As for comradeship, this was no more, for our comrades had gone. You know, and that's, that's pretty devastating, isn't it? So, so what that means is morale has been shot to pieces. None of the originals left. New guys are coming in. They feel strangers. They don't feel bonded. The crews might feel feel bonded, but but it's hard to bond with other crews because there's a kind of wariness and distance about that because you don't want to become friends with someone who's going to be shot down on the next mission. And it's winter and it's dark and it's freezing cold and the conditions are miserable and they don't feel like they're achieving anything. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's catastrophic, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it, it's... This balancing act of keeping morale going, keeping the campaign going. I mean, you wonder if if they'd been going into a summer and the bombing were, were able to be... Obviously, the, the, the bad weather is good because it grounds fighters and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. It helps in that regard. You wonder, you wonder if they were going into a summer, how... If they were going into another really, really, really bad time ahead of them, what, yeah. what would have happened to their morale? Whether morale doesn't collapse. I mean, it's extraordinary. It's absolutely mm. extraordinary. And again, you know, both bomber campaigns as part of the combined bomber offensive, the, the morale doesn't collapse and they keep going. I think it's the it's the it's the most extraordinary thing. And obviously, but the, it's, it's it's on the point of collapsing, isn't it? Yeah, That's yeah, absolutely. It, yeah, it, it's yeah, pretty yeah. close. And of course, this is all being this is all coinciding with it, with the transformation of the air defence system over the Reich. Yeah, you know, yeah. with this the, with this following Operation Gomorrah, the bombing of Hamburg that the Germans have kind of sort of kicked the old system into touch and they're now getting much better and, and they've got this proper kind of air defence system. I mean, having said that, you know, new bomb groups are still arriving and not least the 445th bomb group, part of the new second division, uh, which is just equipped with B-24 Liberators. And it's the 703rd bomb squadron of the 445th, for example, that's commanded by Jimmy Stewart, the, the film star. Yeah. So he's coming over at this time, you know, and he's commanding a squadron and doing his bit and going into battle and all the rest of it. But um, Well, and um, uh, Clark Gable's a, a gunner, isn't he, at this point? Yeah, yeah, he's a waste gunner. That's right, which is just amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. However, it has to be said that by this time, by, by kind of sort of November 1943, there absolutely is a solution to the problem that the Mighty Eight finds itself in. This is how to get a long-range fighter to escort the bombers all the way deep into the Reich and back. Um, it's just whether this is going to going to kind of sort of arrive in time. So I think I think the moment has arrived to look at the at the Mustang. Well, one of the great planes. 
I mean, the thing is, is if you're a regular listener to this podcast, you've heard us perv on Mustangs a lot. And yeah. it is, of course, like many great inventions, it, it's ended up doing something it wasn't designed for at all. It's, it's the greatest American ever, aircraft ever made that the Americans weren't interested in. When it was commissioned, um, they thought they didn't, they didn't really rate it. It's designed by a German, basically. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah, it's, Edgar Schmood. It's, it's all these sort of, it's quite extraordinary. So the background is... Very briefly. Well, yeah. Outbreak, Second World War, British and French think, we need a load of planes all of a sudden. Yep. And the Americans are saying, well, we can make loads of planes. Don't you worry about it. And we'll, we'll happily take your folding um, money for it. Thank you very much. And so uh, the Anglo-French Purchasing Board in 1940, February, order a, a fighter aircraft. 120 days to the is the turnaround. They do the prototype in 117. The order's approved. 4th of May, 1940. Um, for 320. And it's a great, the engine's crap is what it comes down to, isn't it? Yes, because all great all great aircrafts are a marriage of engine and airframe. The airframe of the Mustang is uh, of the P-51. The Mustang, as, as the British call it, is stupendously good. And ergonomically, it's very good. It's very efficient in terms of construction time, how it's made. It's nothing like as complex as a Hurricane or a, or a Spitfire to make. It has all sorts of interesting unique aero, aerodynamic designs features to it, the aerofoil wing, um, the fact that the um, the air intake is much further back and actually creates a sort of effective, what is effectively jet thrust out of the back of it, which, you know, all, all of which is incredibly good. It's $30,000 cheaper to make than a P-47. Um, and, you know, that's, that doesn't sound like a lot for a fighter plane, but it's a huge amount in 1943. Um, so all, all of which is good. It is, it, it is just the Allison V-1710, which is not really it's terrible. It. It's, yeah. it's terrible. It's not very good. And the, and the big problem is is, is that the v, V-1710 is not very good um, at height. So it's it's absolutely fine under 10,000 feet, but it's not it's not above that. And and obviously a fighter plane, an escort plane, needs to operate at very high altitude. And, and so that that's a major problem. But the RAF are taking it in terms of it's a fighter plane that they have, and they'll roll it. They'll find a role for it is what they've done. But the problem is, is you know, ME109s, FW190s are around, and it's it's just not literally not keeping up with the competition. But fortunately, the way it's the way it's designed, the way it's built, is there's room in it for a Merlin. Well, it is, and it's really interesting because I was up at, up at Rolls Royce with uh, with Roland White, and um, we were looking at this. And when you look at the Allison V1710. And you compare it to a, a Merlin 10, you can see the size is is basically the same. What you haven't got is you haven't got the um, supercharger on the V seventeen ten, which is a big problem. That's that's the kind of that is the issue for it. And that's why it's not very good above above ten thousand feet. But it's a longer engine than the Merlin. But when you put the Merlin with its supercharger side by side with the V seventeen ten, it takes pretty much the same space in an engine cowling, which means it can slot straight into a Merlin. And this is spotted by Ron Harker, who's the chief test pilot at Rolls-Royce, and he recognises that that the airframe of the Mustang is is stupendously good and wonders what will happen if you put a Merlin 61 in, into it, which has a, after all, has a, has a horsepower of 1,565 compared with the 1,150 of the Allison. And it absolutely transforms it. And of course, the Merlin sixty one is now in Spitfire nines, which are uh, which are just emerging in nineteen forty three, and and can outperform the latest one i nine and Focke Wolf one ninety. So it's absolutely, you know, it's clearly it's is is worth the punt, and it absolutely transforms it. Um, it's kind of interesting because th- there's there's nothing wrong with the Spitfire nine at all. The Spitfire is is you know known as the pilot's ultimate Spitfire and 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 the ultimate fighter plane of the Spitfire marks. And it's perfectly capable of doing extreme mileage. It's just that the RAF have not pursued this. The Spitfire would have been every bit as good as a uh, could have been every bit as good as a as a Mustang as a long a long range fighter. It's just it's just they don't. It's interesting you say that because because um, our dear friend Joe Coles at Hushkit, there's a he, he has a long there is an, a long article about you know what you would get turning a Spitfire into a long range escort compared. to... Okay, the, so so what does he say? He says it would. It he says work. no, not really. And part of the interesting thing is. Is that the, the Mustang? The way that the way the Mustang's designed, it's uh, and Richard Grace talked about this. It's a much more stable aircraft yep. than the than the Spitfire. The Spitfire's twitchy, so it's hard work to fly, harder work to fly with with drop tanks or just generally, just in general, because it's a pursuit dogfighting aircraft. That really the the Mustang isn't really. It's a more stable air because it's for because it, as an escort plane, it's for flying long distances. And then you turn up and you, you attack someone, and then and then you and then you turn around and you fly home. But its high wing loading means it's incredibly nimble. 
Yeah, but you know, it can flick roll faster than anything else, for example. But it's more. But it's an easier fly right, than the right, Spitfire. Right, right. And it, he's Richard talked about this that you know that the, the, the fundamentals of it are, are quite different for that reason. And you still even because what one of the things with the, the with the with the Mer, with the Merlin on the uh, and it's you know it's Packard Merlins, American made Packard Merlins as well. Is that they cap it, don't they, on the on the Mustang? They aren't using the full horsepower even to get that performance out of, out of it. That's what Richard told us. They sort of cap by ten yeah, percent yeah, yeah. or something. So, so you're not straining the engine so much. So it's more fuel efficient, full stop. Whereas the Spitfire, they're not doing that. So to to get it to perform at altitude, at distance, is burning through more fuel anyway. So the Spitfire isn't actually as good a bet as the Mustang for this role. But, no, I think that's a that's a completely fair point. But by the summer of 1942, there are loads and loads and loads of Spitfire 9s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and yeah. lots of Spitfires, all of which you could turn into. It might not be as good as the Mustang, but you, you still could turn it into a long-range fighter, should there be the willing to do so. Because drop tanks and internal tanks are not easy to kind of add. The drop tanks are not difficult to add at all. And there's been plenty of examples of Spitfires flying extreme long range, such as the photo of a constant Spitfires. Uh, admittedly, they're, aren't, they're not armed, but, but you know, it can be done and you can fly off an aircraft carrier and get to Malta from one end of the, you know, from, from the western end of the Mediterranean to halfway down. So it, it's perfectly possible, but, but there, is, there is a singular unwillingness by the commander in chief of fighter command, who is my old friend Trafford Lee Mallory, to do so. You know, he just finds reasons why, why you can't do it. And, and that's because... He has always jealously guarded all his aircraft and doesn't like anyone else letting them out of his hands. And he's terrified that you know the Americans are going to hog all the all the spits and all, and so on. And and you know he's just it reflects very badly on him and and frankly reflects very badly on the air ministry and the RAF that they're they're so unwilling to help at a time where this is so completely essential. There's a, there's a sort of closed doorness about the RAF in the in the summer of 1943. As the American Eight Air Force is sort of hitting a crisis point, it feels decidedly lacking in collaborative spirit, which I think is frankly embarrassing. Thinking about but it, it's the fighter end of the RAF. Is, is yes, the- fighter end of the RAF, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not not in the leadership, but but you know, it's 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 not a good look. Anyway, be that as it may, the the Mustang has already been singled out by Ron Harker, who ha- who is great mates with Tommy Hitchcock, who's the assistant air attaché in London. And he was actually the model on which Scott Fitzgerald based Tom Buchanan in The Great Gatsby. But, so he's a bit of a dandy. He's a bit of a kind of, you know, man about town, all the rest of it. But he's also a very talented pilot, good friends with Ron Harker. And he um, absolutely signals straight away to the US, says, you, you need to do this. You need to get these Packard Merlins in, in, the, in the P-51 and, and, and too sweet. And they do. And what they discover is that with the, with the Merlin, at, f- at 5,000 feet, it can fly 375 miles an hour. But at 10,000 feet... With this super, you know, amazing supercharger that it has on the on the Merlin sixty one, and indeed the Packard Merlin, it can fly at four hundred miles an hour. At twenty thousand feet, it can do four hundred thirty miles an hour, and at thirty five thousand feet, it can do four hundred fifty five miles an hour, which is seventy miles an hour faster than any German fighter plane at this stage above heights of 28,000 feet. And that's a huge advantage because, of course, you always want height because when, you're, when you've are when you got height, you can manipulate yourself so the sun is behind you and you have the advantage of extra diving speed. So that's why you always want height. And it's suddenly transformed from being a kind of average aircraft or not very good aircraft to being an absolute game changer. The interesting thing about it is that it is, although this is all happening in, the, in, the, in October 1942, not October 1943, the potential to go long distance is not discovered or, or not kind of pursued until the summer of 1943. So kind of, you know, nine months after the marriage of the Merlin with the with the Mustang. But then along comes, I mean, the, the thing I love about the drop tank, you know, is it's made of paper. Yep. <laughs> the Atlas Lace Paper Company. Start, they, they do tests with them. They've they got one in the museum at Sywell, actually. They've got yeah, one. they have. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can, uh, you can they, literally pick it out with one hand. Yeah, it's it's extraordinary, and they realise that that it worked, and certainly for the outward journey, for the bit where you're not being bothered by the enemy, you know, you can keep up with the bomber stream without any problems whatsoever. It doesn't really affect the handling of the aircraft, and it'll get you as far as Berlin. I mean, I think I think that yeah, you can you can just pick the thing up. It's quite it's quite extraordinary. Yeah, they're made on a mould. It's layers and layers of paper, so it's like it's like MDF or like a compressed cardboard thing layers yeah. and layers and layers and layers of paper 
made on a mould with a fuel-resistant lacquer, three pieces stuck together. It's cured. It's pressure tested to six pounds per square inch. And they're given two coats of dope, followed by two coats of aluminium paint. Dunna! Problem solved. Uh, let's get on with winning the Second World War. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. And except that it's it's not married with the Mustang until the summer of 1943. And it, what's really interesting is that, that Hap Arnold, the commander-in-chief of the Arm, U.S. Army Air Force, gives, gives this directive to his deputy, who is Lieutenant General Barney Giles, in June 1943. So this is before Schweinfurt won. And he says, within this next six months, you've got to get a fighter to protect our bombers. Whether you use an existing type or have to start from scratch is your problem. Get to work on this right away, because by January 44, I want fighter escort for all our bombers from UK into Germany. I mean, that's an instruction and a half, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Just get on with it. Six months is a long time to turn that around, though, isn't it? Fortunately, Robert A. Lovett, who is the United States Assistant Secretary of State for War, has already identified the long range potential of the P fifty one. Yeah. It's 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 he, a civvy, rather than Giles, the, the deputy of the commander of the USAAF. Yeah. Who comes up with the solution. So immediately he Lovett tells Giles this, and Giles flies over to North American in California, who produces the, the Mustang, and first of all insists on trying to put a hundred tank gallon behind the pilot. And, you know, Edgar Schmoot's a bit kind of dubious about this. But it flies absolutely fine. Then they add two bulletproof larger tanks in the wings. And they again, you know, they're kind of, well, I'm not sure it's going to be able to cope with this, but it does. That's the thing a Spitfire doesn't have room for. Is the, I mean, no, this is that, one of the things. That, all of which is true. That is true. Yeah, because the Mustang airframe is a sort of boxier, bulkier um, prospect yep, yep. in a way. Thicker wings. Been designed. And then they go for t- two drop tanks as well. These paper marvels. 75 gallon each. Yeah. B-51 takes off. No problem at all. And suddenly you've got your game changer because suddenly this can fly 1,474 miles, which is enough to take from Suffolk in the East Anglia in England all the way to Warsaw and back, not let, let alone Berlin. So, you know, it is it's it is a game changer. I mean, there's, there's no question that missed opportunities have have been, well, opportunities have been missed. Have been missed. Before then, you know, this is a, this is a problem that could have been solved a lot earlier. But, you know, it's not as though the Allies haven't got other things to think about and a lot on their plate and all the rest of it, so one should... But these Mustangs start to start to arrive by November of forty three. The 354th have been equipped with P-51Bs. I think the Mustang in people's mind is the one with the bubble canopy, with the you know, the teardrop canopy, which is the D, isn't it? These are still they still have an inline canopy with the with the with the fuselage. Yeah, but um, in but, all other respects, it's exactly the same. Yeah, yeah. But they're arriving and they're turning up. Blakesley then goes, Well, where am I? Where are my P fifty ones for the fourth fighter group? Yeah, no, he's furious about it. But obviously it makes sense to you know, what you don't want to be doing is what I mean, the thinking behind it is that you don't want the time lag of, of a fighter group having to change over and switch aircraft and train and all the rest of it. So much better to send a fully formed brand new fighter group over with them, uh, which is what the 354th is. But hilariously, they send they send Blakesley straight over to Boxstead, where they're based in Suffolk, to kind of lick them into shape. And, and first of all, he gives them a kind of a bit. He, doesn't, he just turns up, jumps out of his plane, doesn't say anything, just growls at them, and then calls them all into the kind of, you know, the, the, the um, operations room and, and, and gives them a briefing and gives them some sort of basic tactical advice. And he says, you need to be aggressive and fast at all time and you should never ever ever turn away from a head on attack so one of the pilots puts up over the 350 puts, puts hands up and says you know what what happens if the enemy proves as bullheaded in that case son you'll have earned your extra flight and pay <laughs> he's just brilliant and the p-51 start to make a big difference don't they so yeah, so they're, they're flying really their their first sorties with them and you know the pilots love them and are clamoring to fly every mission because they they just love these planes so much so in in the in the 356 captain dick turner has to set up a rotor to give pilots a fair play chance of flying i mean you can contrast the morale in the fighter (laughs) groups fighter wings isn't it it's extraordinary so the scene is set they have the aircraft they have the means to escort the bombers into the heart of the reich they have the the plan is that they're going to destroy the luftwaffe and fighter production is the is the locus of that of its execution so that is our next episode yeah and the, the cliffhanger at the end of 1943 is they've now got the solution they've now got the first sol- aircraft of this solution in theater it's just 
will there be is there still enough time to do what they need to do before before operation May the overlord first. the cross channel invasion yeah yeah and that is that's the million dollar question i think we should end it on that note so long so long jim <laughs> yeah so long al yeah hey take it easy Bye, but bye. Before we descend into ridiculous, um, cartoonish voices, there are two ways you can listen to the rest of this series, and in fact, delve deep into our um, extensive, gigantic back catalogue of series and topics and all that sort of stuff. Which is to search for us on Apple Podcasts and subscribe to our channel. That's right, we we got ourselves a channel on Apple Podcasts, um, and where everything's anthologized and curated for your ease of navigation for finding other subjects. But also, what you get to do is jump the queue. You're not going to wait till next week for the rest of this. Or you can go to our Patreon, Patreon.com/slash We Have Ways, where the same thing is on offer, but more news of what we're up to, debate and discussion amongst our listeners, all sorts of stuff, and a live cast that we do every couple of weeks where Jim and I, you get the chance to watch us watch us doing this, sat in our um, respective man caves discussing the, the, the Second World War and all its ramifications. I think the thing that's really striking me from talking about this is how powerful ideology can be, which is, a li- when you think about it, that is the story of the Second World War. It's like, where does ideology take you? And it, in this case, it took the Eighth Air Force to the edge of the, a cliff, didn't it? Yeah, basically. It's just such a fascinating story, though, isn't it? I mean, we said when we started, this is not a straight line. It's twists and turns and jeopardy and cliffhangers and edges of precipices and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it, it really, really is. It's evasive action. It's an engine on fire, starboard outer engine on fire. It's the whole All lot. that. And it's, and it's got yeah. amazing characters in it. It's just, it's such a fantastic story. Okay, so we'll see you next time. Uh, cheerio. Howdy doody. Cheerio. Goodbye. <laughs> Farewell. Farewell. <laughs>